All right, g'day guys. Welcome back to another True Footy podcast. This is episode 54, and today I'm joined by the three gentlemen that make up Sporting HQ who came together to come up with their recent documentary, AFL The 2010s, uh, Footy's Bold Era. Welcome, lads. How are we all going? Good, thanks. Thanks Thank you. I should introduce you. Uh, We've got uh, Cameron here. Maybe wave for the viewers so that we know who Cameron is. Uh, Tim, how are you going? And Alex, <laughs> yeah, that makes it simple uh, going forward. Um, cool, lads. So it's great to have you on this podcast on the True Footy uh, channel. Um, so obviously, there's a few things to unpack today. I really want to get into, you know, um, your recent documentary, which was obviously spanning the AFL decade that was, which is, you know, so much content to unpack there. Um, but also, I kind of also want to sort of dive into, you know, Sporting HQ and how that came to be. So, am I right in thinking, Cameron, you sort of uh, initiated Sporting HQ, is that right? Yeah, so I started a, quite a long time ago now. Uh, I think it's 2011 when I started. Actually, started as a YouTube channel, um, and it was it was mostly just re-uploading stuff I found on other websites, so the, the AFL website, stuff like that. And that was back when there was barely anything on YouTube. So, you, you put something up there and lots of people watched it. But the problem I found was um, YouTube doesn't like that. AFL doesn't like that. They take that down. And that moved towards Facebook, um, website, Instagram, those types of things where you can kind of find your audience. Um, and I found that easier for Sporting HQ. And then on, along the way, had other people join, um, writers on the website, um, video makers, um, team narrating, that type of thing. And, yeah, it's grown from there. Alex joined, I think, 2017. Maybe yeah, around. towards the end of 2017, yeah. Yeah, yeah, as a writer and lots of people come and, come and gone. Um, but, yeah, it's kind of just grown from, yeah, all the way back in 2011. Wow, that is a, a long time uh, time span. Um, maybe for someone who might not have, you know, come across your platform before, what kind of content would they expect to see from Sporting HQ? Is it, is it, is it analysis, is it highlights, is it both, or what, what sort of stuff do you guys do? It, yeah, it's a bit of everything. I think it's kind of changed from when it first started. It was very much just highlight-based, but it's kind of gone towards, I think probably what most people will see was like the compilation videos, um, yeah, narrating, um, yeah, all that type of stuff was what kind of got the the biggest audience, um, montages as well. And that's probably what I've found to be what I enjoy most because that's what people enjoy. So, yeah, it's, it's probably a bit of everything really. But yeah, it, it's it's multiple sports. Footy and cricket's probably the predominant sports, but basketball, soccer, yeah, e- everything really. Okay, w- what was the inspiration for starting this? You said it was back in 2011, so like this sort of thing, particularly in AFL. I mean, I know it's other sports as well, but particularly in AFL, there really wasn't too much of this going on back then. What made you start it? I think that was the thing. There wasn't anything on there, and. Yeah, it, it, was, it was just like grew from, grew from just wanting to put things on YouTube and just getting people watching it. I think the first video I posted was, um, I think it was Nick Nanui Mark of the Year um, nomination from like 2011. And I looked on YouTube, it wasn't on there. And I put it up, I got like a thousand views the next day. And I thought that was wow. like the most amazing thing. Um, but really, it was just taking the AFL's thing. There was no creativity behind it. There was absolutely nothing. And then the next week, I thought, oh, I'll try this again. And it was some soccer interview or something. It got taken down immediately. And I realized, you actually got to put some work into this. And it can't just be, you know, put one video up and you're going to get a million views type thing. Yeah, I can relate to that totally. Uh, I think, a, I wouldn't say a lot of channels, but mine, I did the same thing. I uh, We started as a podcast originally, but then I started supplementing that with highlights and uh, like compilations and montages and stuff like that. And then um, I did, I made like a full on doco that got um, that taken down because it was just like large extended highlights of the Eagles flag win. And then I was like, I wasn't really adding too much creativity to it. So I got pinged for it. So yeah, I had to develop in the same way as well. Um, What, I guess, did you, did you sort of draw from like other inspirations or was it just kind of like, hey, no one's doing this for these sports, I'm going to do it now? Or did you did you look at other pages, perhaps in other sports, to sort of draw inspiration from? Yeah, it was whatever was current at the time. Um, back, I think, maybe around 2015, there was a page, the Greenfield Post. That was extremely popular. 
with kind of parroting what was happening in footy. And I think those guys ended up, um, now, I think they now work for Triple M. So that, that, that stuff was really popular at the time. I just wanted to give it a crack best I could. I think from there I found that doing my own thing probably works best rather than looking at what other pages are doing. But I think, yeah, whatever inspiration I can find, uh, footy, footy shows, I think before the game was a show I loved, that type of comedy was anything I could try and do. Yeah, I like it. Nice one. Do you, um, I guess, because it's a general sporting page, are you, I'll ask this question of all of you, is is AFL the number one or are you more leaning towards other sports? Uh, AFL's number one for me, for sure. Yeah. Yep. Because you're all Melbourne boys, right? All Victorian, right? Yeah, Melbourne. Melbourne boys, yep. Yeah. Oh, so you're all AFL first? What about you, Alex? Uh, AFL probably, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rotating top three of AFL, soccer, and basketball. It just dep- it depends on the mood, depends on the day, but probably soccer just, but, you know, foot, I guess uh, soccer because, I don't know, I just got influenced by it. Basketball because of um, the late, great Kobe Bryant. And yep. um, uh, AFL because, I mean, you know, like we're, we're all Melbourne boys. It, it, it's pretty much impossible to avoid AFL. And yeah, you can't like you can't escape the assignment. The assignment is just very uh, captivating. I do come from a footy family, so yeah. Yeah, nice one. With with your involvement, then do you do you do content on like a variety of sports as well, or do you have a specialty? Yeah, um, I def- I started with soccer um, because when I came in was right at the tail end of tail end of the AFL season in 2017. So and obviously there was wasn't really much to do. So and soccer was that's when soccer starts. So I was doing a few um, like you know, different soccer articles, and that's what I. have I think it's because what I watch the most, what I read about the most, it's what I was most sort of natural, that came to me more naturally. So I got comfortable with that. Basketball started and then, um, so I was doing a bit of basketball and Cameron said, you know, has a footy knowledge. I said, decent, pretty good. And, you know, I do watch it. And yeah, so then I ended up doing footy. So I tend to rotate between soccer, footy and basketball just because, just because, yeah, like they're the, they're the ones that I watch the most. So it's most easier for me to be able to, to write something really, really good about. So, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I, uh, I really respect that because, um, you know, uh, true footy, it's in the name. We're just footy. Um, as I've gotten older, I've really zeroed in on footy as my number one passion. And I've bat- dabbled with a couple of cricket videos um, and they did well. So I might consider doing them again. But um, I find it very, very hard to be intelligent about like more than one thing at one time. Um, it's particularly sports. So that's, that's um, you know, a huge feather in your caps. Um, well, I guess one little sort of question before we move on to the actual documentary that you made recently. Um where what's the ambition for you know this platform where do you see it going what do you want to see it become and uh is there anything different you'd like to be doing so uh, this is sort of a massive question um but yeah maybe cameron if you take this one away i think it's just to grow as big as possible uh, when i first started it was just a, a bit of fun but now i just love doing it it's escape from you know, work or uni, whatever it might be. It's just something fun you can do and you'd be able to put something out and then you can just see how people react to it. So I just wanted to go as big as possible. It'd be great if it was like a Fox Sports kind of rival type thing. But is that realistic? I don't know. But for me, it's just to grow as big as possible. There's no there's no real limit. Whether it's a career, it's hard to tell. But, um, yeah, I think I think if you put too many limits on things, then, yeah, yeah or you, your dreams are too high, you maybe setting yourself up to fail. So for me, it's as best as possible. Yeah, nice one. All right, so I guess transitioning into, you know, the documentary that you recently did, um, what, where did the idea for that and the inspiration sort of stem from? Because that is a huge sort of project to undertake and obviously you all did, you know, what seemed to be equal parts. So what was like the breakup responsibilities as well, um, but also how did it come to be? It started from... I used to watch a lot of those um, ones on, I think they're on YouTube now, but 90s, 80s, 70s ones that, um, that were made back then at the end of each decade. And I remember watching thinking that this was the most amazing thing. It was done so well. I think Channel 7 were the ones that did it. And then it came to the end of 2009, so the uh, 2000 ones had come out, and there, there just wasn't like one out there. There was, I think, Channel Seven did a very small one, but it wasn't as good. I thought it wouldn't be great if I could make something like that and be able to put it out there. So I kind of had the idea in my head for a while, and it's very, it's the whole documentary is similar to 48 to videos, looking back at things, um, compilations, that type of stuff. 
So I had the idea in my head, and then I'd worked with Tim on a few videos um, doing narration through um, his page, and then Alex, I knew, was a great writer, so it kind of just worked out from there that the three of us could work together. Um, I, I came up with the kind of broad ideas and did the editing, Alex doing the writing, and then Tim the narration. That's cool. So, Tim, uh, did you have, do you have like a background in narrating? Or like uh, no, not actually. I've just done a few sort of voices and impersonations for uh, for Cameron on his page a couple of times, and I'll do some on my page. So he just sort of messaged me and said, would you like to do sort of something different, do a narrating video? And I was like, yeah, for sure. I'd love to. Nice. So uh, he sent, sent through the script, and then, yeah, we sort of just took it from there. Yeah, well, I, I want to know, because, like, I'd imagine that script is fairly lengthy. The documentary is, like, over two hours long. How long did this process take? And I, this is a question for all of you, because you all sort of did different parts, didn't you? Uh, oh, for me, well, because like, I'd get sort of sent the script year by year um, as we go along as the boys were sort of writing it. It did take a few attempts for me as well just to get, like, the right sort of tone and things, get the words right, because sort of, it does sound kind of hard sometimes to try and read it out and be recording and make it sound right. Because um, sometimes I sort of go off my head and do my own script. Like with my videos, I sort of just go off my own thing. So try and make sure you read it properly and say it right. It's actually harder than it sounds. So it took me a while, but yeah, we got there for me. Totally. Because like you, because uh, I've done some of my own voiceovers and you you, you got to sort of know with the tone um, of with the way to speak and also is that going to suit like what you're you're seeing and like you know music and stuff like that I suppose you can edit the music to to the voiceover but I totally know what you mean um, and that must have been like a pretty lengthy process what about you Alex like how how much of a task was this for you um I'll be honest I've probably maybe had it easiest so just because like um you know, like I can ima- I can only imagine how hard it is to, to you know to narrate to edit to do all that sort of stuff it's not as hard as writing um like you know writing all i have to do is really just put up a, like a script a script writing software and then sort of you know go year by year and then add in add in um what was like obviously what was relevant to each year in terms of summarizing the decade the probably the hardest part was more um maybe keep maybe time constraints in terms of um yeah you know, sort of being like okay what's you know say i do like you know 2012 for example okay what can i do from 2012 what should i put in that's relevant what should i put in that's, that's irrelevant you know sort of finding that balance of you know what's what's going to be you know worth putting into you know a decade documentary versus what's not worth so probably just finding that balance and you know really sort of teetering around with the length and it was probably different year by year because some years some years had a lot going on some years didn't like um i remember 2013 was crazy to write because i mean 2013 had a bunch of stuff going on 2010 was 2010 was insane you can do a whole the whole 20 minute video just on the grand final in 2010 so yeah we just sort of maybe separating year by year and finding out what's worth adding in what's, what's not worth adding in yeah, right. That's really interesting. And what about yourself, Cameron? Did you do the editing? Is that right? Yeah. So for me, the the best part was being able to go year by year and get the, all that all that footage together. Um, and that had a good process of being able to start and stop, knowing when to um, what parts to do. Early on, twenty ten, there's not a lot of footage out there on YouTube or wherever to actually use. I think it started from uh, the Telstra. Um, having a partnership with the AFL, which meant they were putting up content like match highlights and stuff, which is a lot of the footage, um, and that made that easier. But you back then, like it was 240p or whatever it is, like just really low quality um, things. And then you look at um, 2019 and when we got the high definition and stuff, that, it's changed quite a bit. So you want to keep that consistency. That was that was probably a difficult part of that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Did you um, – I, I noticed actually you did actually have a lot of high-res footage from – you know, periods that would be very hard to get high res footage from. So you obviously, you know, did a lot of research there. But I'm curious as to how long it took this process from the start to the finish, do you reckon? Because I've done a doco myself that was only about 45 minutes and I found that incredibly painful to get through. But um, how long did you reckon it took? And also, did you enjoy making it or is it more like you look back on it with satisfaction that you've produced something really cool, but was the process itself a bit painful? How would you describe it? So I think it, I think maybe about four months is what it took from start to finish. It was definitely harder over summer um, finding motivation when there was no footy on, sure. and then that that motivation definitely ramped up when um, realised there might not be footy and people might be wanting to watch this type of thing because the idea was that, to come out during the more, middle of footy season. But when there was no footy, the interest probably would have peaked. Yeah, so I think about four months is about about how long it took. Um, yeah, in terms of editing. Yeah, right. And did you? 
uh, what about the other boys as well? Did you do you look back on this with and and feel like you really enjoyed making it? Because I probably w- wouldn't say I really enjoyed making mine. <laughs> I definitely enjoy doing it. Like I always enjoy doing like doing voices and impersonations. So, like for my page, it's something it's good to do something different. Um, like I enjoy it. And then when you look back and watch the video, and you see how well it's all been put together with the script and all the highlights, um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Like, it's good to look back and watch it. Yeah, I think from an editing point of view, when you're watching it, you're always expecting that next mistake to be there. Like when you're yeah. watching it back, so it's hard to watch it fully enjoying it as if like it was someone else's work. But, yeah, there is that satisfaction at the end of it when it's fully done because you try not to watch too much of it because you're going to get sick of seeing the same, you know, parts over and over again if you're trying to watch the whole thing in one go. Um, yeah. Just focusing on those individual parts of editing is probably the best way to do it. Sure. Did you um, – because, like, I've watched it and it seemed very clean and error-free, which is – the opposite of mine because mine my personality is like i'm really not a uh, perfectionist i'm the opposite i like to be hyper productive i like to smash it out and i like to get it up so i if you look back on the documentary you don't have to look too hard to find you know heaps of little editing glitches but uh, like and this is i guess for question for all of you are you sort of like a real perfectionist in the way you work and and does that make it a lot harder yeah i I think i think i am in terms of editing because i know that i'll cringe if i rewatch something and see see a small issue but I think as well like you see those errors and that other people won't see because you know it so well like, a lot of people just don't notice that stuff and might not even be an error but you're watching it so hard that like you're picking at things that probably aren't there so I think feedback from other people like from the other two guys getting feedback from them was really useful because yeah if you're just watching the same thing over and over again and they tell you no there's no problem there it's very reassuring Oh, that's good. That's good. What about you two lads? Do you find you're sort of um, like uptight with the way, not uptight is not the right word, but I sort of pedantic about like doing it in a certain way or are you more like me and you're like, I'm going to smash it out and see what happens? <laughs> um, I think with writing, I can be just because uh, I think like if, if you like if you sort of stuff up the writing a little bit, it can really hurt the structure of something, especially for an article. Like I try and read back and try and like make sure my grammar is good, you know, with like an use of commas and and, you know, like different sort of, you know, like transitioning words and, and apostrophes and all that sort of stuff. Like if I, and I'm pretty pretty big on spelling as well. So if I look back on an article and I see like, you know, a couple of spelling errors, I just like put a bit of a massive face palm. Like, oh, I can't believe I just, can't believe I misspelled that. And I just sort of feel a bit silly. But I mean, you know, like, you know, you'll obviously learn from the mistake, but I can, but I do try my best to, you know, give the best that I can with writing. Because at the end of the day, like the way I see, see things is, you know, if you're going to try something, you know, if you're going to do something, try and give it, you know, your absolute best. Um, obviously, you know, I, as long as you give your best, you know, that's that's all you can ask for. But you might as well, might as well give it 100. percent You don't really want to sort of go half-hearted. So that's probably what brings out this sort of pedantic side out of my out of my work habits. Is just yeah, like you know, giving something its best, you know, treating it with the respect respect that it deserves. Especially something like this. Like this was a big project. Um, you know, Cameron was really enthusiastic about it when he presented it to me. So I thought, right, okay, let's make sure I can write this to the best of my ability and really sort of jazz it up because, you know, this deserves, you know, this deserves 100%, it doesn't deserve anything less. So that was the way I saw it. Nice one. What about you, Tim? Are you sort of, uh, you sort of alluded to it before, but are you sort of like, uh, you know, almost OCD with it or how, what are you like? Uh, well, like normally in life, I'm very much like you are, just get something done, get it out there kind of thing. But I think with voices, like you want it to sound right, you want it to sound good. So I definitely did take a fair few takes with it trying to make sure like different tones and things and like saying it slower or whatever because I realize sometimes in life I talk pretty fast so I've got to make sure that it's slow enough on the doco that it sounds good and sounds like an rating voice so yeah, it took me a fair few attempts with it yeah fair enough I saw I, I'm not sure if I missed it earlier sorry did you say that you have a page of your own yeah I do yeah so it's called um Timmy Roberts and I do sort of impersonations a lot of footy commentators so I got like uh, Jerry Waitley, Mark Robinson, David King, Mark Rusciuto, like Terry Wallace, those sort of guys. So it's kind of like a piss take sort of comedy sort of page um, where I just do a lot of voices. So, Oh, nice one. That, that's on Facebook, is it? Yeah, it's on Facebook, yeah. Okay, so you got got a little bit of the background there for the for the voice acting, so that, that makes sense. So there's a video coming out tonight. Do you want to check it out? It comes out about 6 o'clock uh, Eastern time. Nice. Sort of 3 o'clock your time, I think, isn't it? Yeah, uh, far, 4 o'clock, I think, Perth time. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, two hours behind, sorry, yep. Yeah, oh, nice one. There you go. Um, I also kind of want to ask as well, just uh, before we start talking some real footy, but um, 
I guess it's kind of footy related anyway. Was there anything throughout studying and, and producing this documentary that surprised you? For instance, remembering something that happened that you'd forgotten? And this is a question for all of you. Um, we'll start with Cameron, I guess. Was there anything that, you know, when, when it came up in the doco that you were like, I forgot this happened? Yeah, so I think going back to 2010, that surprised me the most how many things happened that year. Um, one thing I found fascinating was the whole Jackson Ackermanis situation with um, news articles he was making around um, advising gay people to stay in the closet if they were AFL players. And at the time, that was really criticised. Um, and he was criticising people back and all this type of thing. And it really led to the end of his career. And that's something I completely forgot about. Same with uh, the end of Ben Cousins' career as well. Um, I remember he played at Richmond all those um, he had injury problems but you forget that kind of he did play there for a while and at um, the actual end of this decade you forget about all that and same with his documentary that came out in that year as well so there's a few things 2010 probably was the biggest year I found things yeah it's surprising how long ago it actually is what about yourself Alex is anything that you sort of picked up on while while doing this doco um, yeah, probably this, uh, similar to Cameron, a few things in 2010, like, because I, cause I was like a lot, I was, I think I was 14 in 2010, so I was a lot younger, so like I didn't, I don't really remember things as much, and yeah, especially like the Jacob, the Jason Ackermanis thing as well, like I just do not recall it at all, probably because I just didn't really pay attention to it, and you know, the stuff that he was saying was controversial, and now obviously I look back and think, oh, geez, I can't believe I got away with that, or I can't believe that was actually being said, but yeah, like, you know, young, young Alex, you know, barely a teenager. I had just generally no idea. Like, I wasn't really paying attention to that sort of stuff. I just watched footy and then, yeah, and, like, even the um, like sort of the St. Kilda stuff that was going on, that off-field, that, um, mm. I mean, I don't know, I want to really delve into it too much. But, yeah, and, like, the stuff made in the early, in the early 2010s um, was just maybe surprising to me because I just don't really remember it as much because I just didn't really pay attention to it. And I forgot, like, I, obviously, I, I don't I don't forget it. You, you can't forget it, but the Essendon saga – I forgot how dragged on that was. Like, that thing went for, like, you know, that was, like, from 2012 to 2016. Like, I was – the whole time I'm like, oh, geez, this thing actually went forever. Like, I remember, like, as I was up, updating each year, I then, like, look at my notes – like, look at the notes that Cameron gave me look at my own notes and be like, oh, crap, I have to talk about Essendon again. Like, great, there's more, there's more to the story. Like, this thing keeps going. So that took up a lot of time. But um, that was probably the thing that surprised me the most. And I guess one thing that really stood out to me as well was how much footy changed – both from an administrative and like an on-field level, like you look at footy 2010, you look at say like what happened in 2010 versus what happened in 2019, you're like, geez, this game has evolved in so many ways. I mean, there was obviously the Gil McLaughlin transition, how he's tried to move the game forward and the, the money has increased so much. We tried to take it internationally. And I just thought, wow, it's a big like, I think that was also a theme that we tried to put in the third docker as well, was that 2010 was really a decade, or the 2010s were a decade of footy trying to, you know, push itself forward. So, yeah, I was really surprised at how much football has changed in, in nine, 10 or 9 years. Yeah, for sure. Like, I uh, I can I totally relate to that because, I mean, even if you look at um, just a few years ago, you, you don't think footy is changing that much. But if, if you, you've watched, like, a game from 2017, you're like, that, you can tell that's a few years ago. And it's even just little stuff like whether it's the resolution of the, of the footage or, um, you know, the jumper style or, you know, the fashion and everything just looks a little bit different year to year. So it's weird. Like, when I was a kid, I remember thinking... I started watching footy in 2002 and I remember thinking it looked really modern and now you look at it then you're like, wow, what is this, the 80s? It's, it's ridiculous. But uh, what, what about yourself, Tim? Um, any learnings for you or surprising uh, discovery, discoveries? I was going to say, like, obviously I remember it um, like back in 2012 when the Giants were terrible. Like, Giants were terrible in 2012, 2013. Like, you forget, like, how many, like, poundings they copped as a club to start out with. Like, that first two years, like, they're losing every game by, like, 90 points. Because, you know, the last sort of four or five years, they've made, like, prelim finals, grand finals. They've actually been a really good club. But, you know, it's pretty surprising when you look back and you think early on, like, the Suns were smashing the Giants. Like, it's pretty funny when you look back at those sort of things. Yeah. Like, you think that now, like, you just can't even imagine the Suns beating the Giants. And, like, you know, that was a pretty, like, it occurred a fair bit. And then just sort of, like, you know, the rise and fall of teams, like, how quickly, you know, like, a, a side like Port Adelaide rose up, quickly made a prelim in 2014. The next year, they're not there. And then Adelaide did this, like, oh, those post Adelaide teams kind of thing. You know, Adelaide make a grand final in 2017. They're not there 2018. Like, just sort of, then you got sides of prolonged success. Like, it's pretty, yeah, just interesting to look back at the decade. What teams succeed in staying up the top for longer versus some that rose quickly and some that just, you know, decline quickly. Yeah, right. Yeah, totally, totally agree. I also want to ask you as well, maybe your personal highlights for, for the decade. 
Um, I guess we'll start with Cameron because I want to ask you individually as well. Uh, Cameron, you told me off air you're a, you're a Gold Coast fan. Um, what do you do? You have any particular highlights throughout decade? <laughs> I just realised this is a silly question. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. No, but uh, it doesn't have to be Gold Coast related. But can you think of certain things that really stands out to you as a memory of wow, wow, that was amazing. Whether it be like a grand final moment or you know a great narrative, uh, what stands out for you? Well, on Gold Coast, I did actually have one. I think it was. 2010, 2011, the actual formation of the team, because that's something I was oh, nine or ten. I was pretty young. I don't remember that too much, and I was actually surprised there was footage online of that. And that's something I was really looking forward to putting in there, because if you go back and watch the the 90s, the 80s ones, there's they barely mention when teams enter the competition. I remember one of them, and it was like, and in round five, um, Richmond defeated Fremantle, and it was Fremantle's like fifth game ever, and that was the first time they mentioned them. And I was thinking, if I was a Fremantle fan, I would have been looking forward to hearing about how my team started. So that was something I found a highlight, the Giants as well and the Suns. But I think overall, I think the Bulldogs flag was one I really enjoyed um, looking back on. That, that was such a like a brutal game, um, 2016. And same with the prelim against GWS. They were, they were amazing games. Even though I think Bulldogs ran away with it in the end, there was, there was such big moments for those fans, I remember seeing the footage of all the old Bulldogs fans coming out and um, and uh, them airing old footage of like the just terrible years and their their first flag in the fifties or whatever. So that one was really good because you kind of had um, the Hawthorne Geelong dominance. Um, Collingwood won a premiership in there, but it was really refreshing to see a small team like the Bulldogs get up and win. And then, um, and then obviously Richmond won not long after. But I think that was really, really good highlight um, because yeah, they had that one incredible year, and it was you felt followed the journey across the year in those finals and everything like that. Yeah, for sure. And just before we move on to Alex, I also want to know what maybe a personal low light is for you. Jeez, I think yeah, some of those big Suns losses were um, yeah per- personal low lights. Um, Hard to choose. <laughs> Yeah, the first match I ever went to, um, the Suns lost to Geelong by 150 points. That, that wasn't in the doco, luckily, but uh, <laughs> yeah, there's been a fair few of those. Um, yeah, I think I think the Adam Good stuff was really hard to rewatch. Um, it was just so sad, especially towards the end when he didn't even want to do a um, a go around in the the card of the um, grand final. That, that was just so sad to see that happen again. Like such a champion being booed and um, not not really wanting to be honoured. It was um, yeah, it was something that that's kind of been forgotten, I think, in the last couple of years because we just don't hear from Adam Woods anymore. But um, like he was Australian of the Year as well, I think, at that time. So it was yeah, I think that one was uh, particularly hard to rewatch. I think that's a really good nomination for me as well. Uh, at the time of the Adam Good saga, I don't know if I was a bit young or just didn't pay enough attention to it, but I remember, you know, not really thinking about it in the correct way. And now I'm a bit older. I'm think, looking back on it and thinking, geez, that actually really was a shitty part of our history. One of the lowlights of the decade for sure. Alex, what about yourself? Um, like, have you got uh, any particular highlights or lowlights? Because um, you're a North Melbourne fan, but it doesn't have to be club related or it can be. Um, well, it's hard to be club related. I go for North. Um, I guess maybe maybe the couple of prelims we made um, in 2014-15, um, just because the 14, the 14 win against Essendon, that first that elimination final, like we had no right to win that after being smacked in the first half. And so, um, you know, seeing that second half, the second half comeback, especially being surrounded by Essendon fans, was pretty fun. You know, it was sort of like, and it's always a good trump card. Like whenever Essendon fans want to talk a bit of crap, I always just bring up the whole, I always just give them the Drew Petrie boxing kangaroo gift. Just like, you know, hey, you know, you still haven't won a final when we won a final at your expense. And I was at the, the 2014, the that semi-final against Geelong. I was there and I was at the um I was actually at the at the pocket where Tom Hawkins was like he just led that comeback for Geelong. So I was like panicking, panicking. And then uh, Goldstein took like a really clutch mark at the end of the game to 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 secure the win. That was right in front of me. So that was like that was a pretty fun, fun moment. And I was with my cousin, who's a diehard Geelong, a Geelong diehard. So like we have, we had a rule: don't like no getting into his face about wins or losses, just out of respect. So that was a pretty funny moment. Um, and then yeah, the, the prelim the year after beating Richmond in that elimination final was hilarious, especially because Cunnington should have been done for holding the ball in the at the end, but I, I won't talk about it. Um, and that like, yeah, that was always just cool seeing North Melbourne you know do well for once. 
Um, seeing Harvey get the rec- the game's record was big, which is because he was my favorite player growing up as well. Um, you know, big big idol of mine. So seeing him, you know, finally get that record that we all hoped he'd get was really really nice. Um, really nice seeing and not North Melbourne related. Definitely the 2016 Grand Final, the Bulldog story. You can't. We all love an underdog story, and 2016 was the year of underdogs in sports. So that was just a really really good sort of cherry on top for what had been a great year. And the 2018 Grand Final was, was really good as well. That was really exciting, really brutal, you know, like a good, fun game to watch. Like as a neutral, I could not have asked for a better Grand Final. Um, as for lowlights, my big, uh, I guess maybe my biggest lowlight, probably the 20, the first one for, was 2010, the Grand Final, just having that replay because it's just such a stupid concept. Like, I guess looking back, the fact that we actually let a draw go to a replay the next week, charge, make fans buy tickets again, and it just sort of like maybe because if the first grand final was so good, having it replayed was just kind of tainted how good the first final was. So that kind of sucked. And then going back to North Melbourne, um, that whole Boomer Harvey, uh, was the Boomer Harvey, Drew Petrie, uh, Nick Dalsano, Farid, and Michael Farido, that whole sacking him and announcing it right before we went to the finals. We had that really crappy second half yeah. of 2016. And then, you know, hearing that, you know, oh, you know, Three, three big servants to your club and like you know a really good really good play for the previous couple of years we're just gonna be let go like that especially for Harvey as well that was that sucked like I went to the last the last home and away game um, against Jabu West at the at the time the Eddie had Stadium and it was just a really sour mood we got smacked by Jabu West and it was just sour horrible it was yeah it wasn't it wasn't fun it wasn't it wasn't a good it wasn't a good couple of weeks to North Melbourne fans to seeing your seeing your your arguably the club's biggest icon get treated like that. So that probably might be, might be my biggest low light. Yeah, that was, wasn't fun. Yeah, right. Fair enough. Fair enough. And Tim, I believe you're a, uh, a Hawthorne fan, so you've got a few highlights to pick from. But again, it doesn't have to be club related. Um, what were your sort of highlights and lowlights from the decade? Yeah, I think highlights for me, I'd probably say the curse-breaking game against Geelong back, back in 2013, like the prelim. Like that atmosphere that night was like insane, like being there. And I went to all... All four grand final at the one we lost. And then, yeah, I think the atmosphere that night when we beat Geelong, probably was like the best atmosphere I've ever been at in any sort of sporting event. Like, you couldn't hear the siren, people just crying all around you. So that was probably my highlight of the decade or beating Buddy. But um, from like a non Hawthorns perspective, I'd probably say also like what Alex said, the 2018 grand final um, with West Coast, your team, actually. Yeah, like I watched that game again the other day, and like the last five minutes is awesome. Like that play with McGovern taking the specky down the wing to Liam Ryan, all the way through to Dom Sheik kicking a goal from the pocket. Like, you just couldn't run a bit of script in that grand final, being down by five goals. Um, and I also really enjoyed Mason Cox's prelim. I reckon that was a great night for footy. Seeing, like, like an international guy come in, you know, who's been bagged the last three years, everyone's saying he's no good. Comes out, takes on the red-hot favourites and kicks three goals at a quarter and sets up his team's win. Like, that was also, I actually think it was a great moment for footy all around. Like, watching a guy who's never played the game before tear it up on the big stage yeah i can relate to that i i really don't like amazing cox personally but um as an eagles fan who were playing in the other prelim i really wanted richmond to get flogged so i must admit i was absolutely jumping for joy every time he would sail for a mark did you have any particular low lights i know it's um, you might not have any hawthorne low lights but uh, was there anything uh, you think was a real low light of the decade I think you guys discussed the Adam Goods thing earlier that was definitely when you look back i think i was pretty ignorant at the time as well like what you guys were saying um uh, any lowlights? Yeah, I guess like Hawthorne losing grand final might have been a low light too. But like, I think the decade was, yeah, for me was pretty good. Like, I can't really think of many others. Actually, I think another great highlight was um, Alex Johnson coming back from his fourth knee reco. And that was also a great moment seeing a guy who's battled it out for so long to get back and play. Um, and then also Marlene Pickett last year is a pretty good story. When you, when you look back and watch that doco that was on the ABC um, a couple of weeks ago as well, it was a good moment too. What do you yeah, I like it. Yeah, I um, I'll chip in with a few of my own. Obviously, as an Eagles fan, I uh, I think the 2018 Grand Final speaks for itself. Um, but in terms of non-Eagles, I think uh, like you boys sort of alluded to, that 2016 Grand Final will be one of my favourite Grand Finals of all time for that underdog story. It's just a great contest, and the Bulldogs winning from seventh is just a sick narrative. I must admit, and I'm sorry, Tim, but the 2012 Grand Final has to be up there game. for me. Yeah, that was uh, that Malchewski goal. I think he kicked, did he kick the first as well. Actually, I'll mention too yeah. the when you, I looked back and watched the Tom Hawkins goal after the Soren game, and yeah. like, I do kind of enjoy watching that game now because it's probably the best game of footy I've ever watched. But obviously, it still hurts. But like, yeah. it's a great game of footy as well. So that's probably another highlight. 
I suppose when you banked three flags in that decade, you can be a little bit more forgiving about the games like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> the Miracle on Grass as well, actually, I forgot to mention. That was far out. That's one for me that I forget yeah. happened in the decade. Yeah. I, was, for some reason, so I thought it was... It was 23rd. Like, Simon Black was in that game. Yeah, like, yeah. That, that's a long time ago. And, like, yeah, that was Miracle it. On Grass. Yeah. 53 points yeah. In, in the fourth quarter. The, the 250th game. I'll go on the siren, yeah, that... Like looking back, looking back and writing about it, that was fun. It was just fun yeah. relieving that moment. Even while Edity, I was thinking, there's no way they're going to win this when they're like 40 <laughs> points down. And it was just like a boring Sunday night match. And then they just kick goal after goal. And some of the goals they were kicking, I think Daniel Rich kicked three just outside 50. It was unbelievable that game. Yeah, Daniel Rich, when he wants to be on, he can kick some like murderous goals. He's unreal for sure. All right, lads, before we sort of uh, wind it up, I do want to ask you a little bit more questions about the clubs that you support. Um, so, Cameron, I don't know too many Gold Coast fans, um, to be honest, and that's not me being a smart ass. They're just uh, here in Perth, they're few and far between. Because um, you're, you're Victorian, right? So I want to know, why did, why did you choose Gold Coast? So family was Geelong supporters and, uh, like, young was Geelong. But I never kind of felt part of the supporting team. And then 20, uh, 2008, I think, 2009, the Suns were in the VFL. And I started watching that, started um, finding I was supporting them more and um, just kind of grew from there, hit 2011. And that first game, I felt like a fan. And like, even though I think we got pumped by 120 points, like, it didn't matter, it was the first game. But from there, I just felt this real underdog type of thing. And I thought in 10 years' time, we're going to be this like dominant team and I'm going to be supporting this you know, started from the start kind of thing. Even though that hasn't happened, it's I've still felt to be great that I supported the team from the start. And I know every other Sun supporter I know feels the same way. And because the team's so small, it's a very close-knit vibe. So every um, Victorian match, I have to do the cheer squad have with the banner and stuff. And I've been into the rooms probably every game in Victoria the past two years or so. And um, even though we don't win much, whenever we do in Victoria, it's just like such an unbelievable feeling. So there's definitely been times where I've gone like, why, why do I support this team kind of thing? And you look at other people and they complain, oh, you know, we lost three in a row or something, like try 16 in a row, that sort of thing. But, yeah, for me, I don't think that it, I've ever regretted it at all. Um, but, yeah, it, it's definitely something I get asked probably every single day, why do you support them and get yeah. made fun of school, made fun of uni, whatever. But, um, but yeah, I, f- I feel more part of the actual club than I think most fans do because it's so close-knit. Um, but, yeah, it, it's definitely the hardest teams to support. I don't think any argument about that. Yeah, for sure. I would have been confident that Gary Ablett Jr. was a factor in your switching, but was that unrelated? It was just a bonus? No, it, it was, yeah, it was unrelated, um, but... Yeah, most people think it is related, and yeah, uh, yeah it's hard to tell people otherwise. Um, but yeah, that, that was just a coincidence. Yeah. Um, are you confident in where Gold Coast is going? Because I kind of feel like you... I mean, I mean, Gold Coast haven't actually been really, really bad for that long. Like, there was a period during sort of the middle of the decade, and I might be a little foggy on the details, but they were never really the worst team. In fact, like, I think they'd only won one spoon uh, up until recently so yeah, last, i mean yeah, yeah. the last year that's right i think it's their second spoon so i guess my point is they had that horrible like stephen may tom lynch jay gromira or dion prestio sort of exit the club i feel like they've kind of just starting to emerge from that now i really like the young guys in lacocious rankin um jack bows will Brody, to name a few how do you feel internally as a suns fan are you getting a little bit excited or is it more like i need to get I need to see more before I get my hopes up. Yeah, definitely the latter. I think yep. there's probably been like three rebuilds, two rebuilds now, yep. which is hard to believe for a team so young. But, yeah, each time it's kind of been like oh, this is the time type of thing. But it is great that, that there's – I don't think there's anyone this year we need to re-sign. Everyone's kind of re-signed, which is good. But the fact you're doing it with a team that hasn't won for a year is is. Like pretty amazing. So I think everyone's really bought into what uh, Jews after, but yeah, there's also that sense that this is this is the third time, and you know how, we can't keep asking for concessions or asking for help. Um, yeah, I don't think that that's the feeling as well. But yeah, I think early on there was 
that those are winning off talent. There was so much talent, but the training standards weren't there. You know, from what I hear, um, Guy McKenna wasn't well liked at all. And then um, it came to Rodney Ede. He kind of uh, he kind of turned those things around with the culture, but he, he was kind of once he did that, he's kind of shot, and he like he wasn't going to be the one. Like he, he was quite old at that stage, so he wasn't going to be the one to kind of coach for 10 years like a you know a proper rebuild so i think now with Ju, like i remember the first time i met him i, I said they hadn't won a game yet i said to him uh, is this harder than you thought he's like no it's exactly what he thought so i think he's been prepared for what it's going to be like and i think someone like him who's come from so much success if he's been able to um if anyone can do it he probably can with what he's had um, behind him yeah, fair enough, fair enough. I, uh, I I kind of agree with all of that. What about yourself, Alex? I, I'm curious as to know where your love for the North Melbourne Footy Club started. Is it a family thing or uh, how'd that start? Um, yeah, so my mum's my family, um, half in North Melbourne, half the Carlton, um, and there's, there's one straight Collingwood, one straight Essendon, which we don't know how that happened, but that happened. Um, and my mum and my, grand, my late grandfather fell into the North Melbourne camp, so it was pretty much either North Melbourne or adoption for me, and obviously... Um, I would have preferred um, North Melbourne. So, um, yeah, but obviously, that, you know, like when, when you're being put into North Melbourne jerseys from birth, you kind of get stuck with it. And my earliest memories, I guess, were us being good in the late 90s, even though I was like three or four. I don't remember it too well. Um, but it was enough to sort of, you know, be like, hey, North Melbourne. And then, you know, I, I started to like Wayne Carey. Then Wayne Carey left to Adelaide. Obviously, I didn't know why at the time. Um, it took me a little while to find out why exactly. Um, but that was like that was good. But at that point, I've always been of the belief that once you pick a team, you know, once you get to that sort of, you know, when you start, even in primary school, you know, you're aware of what's going on. Once you've got a team, that's it, really. Like once you've, you know, you've got jerseys. Once you go to games, that's it. So I sort of stuck with North Melbourne. See, that came from my mum. Um, and yeah, like I was, I was never going to change. Yeah, or like it would have been, would have been a big, a big drama if I changed. So yeah, just happy to stick with them. Yeah, I feel like you're a little bit unlucky there with your age, born in the mid-90s, like you've just missed out on like yeah. peak, peak <laughs> North, North Melbourne. Melbourne. Yeah, but they are a very proud um, like fan base, I've found, North Melbourne. I want to know what your thoughts are on the whole Brad Scott saga. I think, it was, was it like 10, 10 years he coached North Melbourne? And like, what were your thoughts on Brad Scott? Um, I, keep, I, th- I probably, I felt that he should have gone with the whole Harvey, Ferrito, Petrie, Dosano thing. Because at that point, you know, we were sort of, air quotes, pushing for flags at that point. But once we realised that, okay, that flag window, if you want to call it that, was gone and we had just exited, like ex- there was a mass exodus of all these great, great veterans. It was evident that obviously, you know, we wanted to, to you know, put some youth in the squad. So I thought they probably should have gone then. It's like, okay, thanks. You've been with us for seven years. You know, we had, a, we had a good run, you know, but, you know, time for something new. Um, so he probably stuck around a little bit longer, but then we ha- we actually did all right in 2017 and 2018. So I was like, oh, okay, maybe you maybe you're onto something here. But yeah, he probably just overstayed his welcome a little bit. And from what I hear, he was a little bit too um, like he tried to be too clever. He tried to be too smart, um, and just probably wasn't. I think the players probably just got sick of his voice by that point. We needed some some freshness, and um, especially like 29th, like especially start of last season, start of last year there was a couple of really um, odd decisions um, that were being made. And Reece Shaw was like the one guy who was like really close with the plays. And he was the one sort of counteract to any of Brad Scott's wacky ideas. So yeah, I just think, I just think Scott overstayed his welcome a bit and Shaw was a good, a good replacement because he knew the club, he knew the plays. He's one of those, he comes from a really good football family and he's one of those guys who seems to live and breathe footy. He's got like a really good football brain, like kind of a football nerd and he's young, dynamic, and he seems to really just get it. seems really passionate and I think it's nice that we're going through a rebuild. So I want to get like a young, growing coach, get the sort of the, the plays and the coach to the plays and the coach to grow together, and you really sort of learn, learn to love each other and you know have a good feeling. Like I'm not overexcited, but I think it's good just to have a bit of have a bit of hope. Especially like we ended last year well, and we had a good the round the one round that we had this year so far was was a good win. So I guess somewhat somewhat exciting times in, in a sense. Like it's. It's not as dour as it as it could have been, and what it used to be, which is good. Yeah, that's that's uh, true for sure. I uh, my perception of North Melbourne is they're kind of like this club that just refuses to rebuild, and I, that's something I like about them because I think that is actually a good model to follow, provided you're, t- you're recruiting the right talent. Like, look at Hawthorne, look at Geelong, uh, West Coast is trying to do it now. Sydney did it for you know years and years, 
Uh, North Melbourne obviously are going hard for like established players. They went for their Dusties. They went for their uh, well, they got a Polek, but they you nearly know, a gaff. You know, the, the list goes on. Yeah, um, don't, don't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of the current list at North Melbourne in terms of its potential? And how would you think? How do you want the club to go forward? Do you want to say draft picks? Let's build this club with uh, this list from the bottom up, or do you think you should sort of keep on going how you're going and want to add experienced players? What's your belief? Um, I like the, I like the list now in terms of um, having a bit of youth in there. There are still a couple of um, couple of passengers, like you know, a couple of a couple of dead woods. Mm. Um, I won't name them because I just feel I feel a bit bad. You know, they are you know they are just people at the end of the day. But there's still a couple of a couple of uh, dead woods in there that we need to get rid of. But for the most part, you know, sort of that you know trying to youth up the squad has been good and adding a couple of you know uh, veterans in there that aren't too old, but sort of that prime age that are you know willing to to work like. Pollock was a bit of an a bit of an overspend, for example, but he's been like, he's been doing pretty well for the club. As is um, Sam Marley Williams and Peter. They've been they've been good acquisitions too. Ben Brown's good, like you know, like having a having a really good key forward like that, sort of you know, in his prime to build around is always a always an advantage. So I guess we're lucky to have him have someone that that can be built around. My only concern now, my biggest concern probably is actually Ruck. I felt that we should have kept Bra- um, Braden Proust in developing because Goldstein's. Like old since thirty three, I think, and he's still good. He's still great. Don't get me wrong, but you know we're not winning flags anytime soon. So I think it was best that we should have just traded him for like a top pick, build build Bruce, um, and build Bruce up into you know into a solid number one ruck. But trading him for Don Tyson probably wasn't the best idea. But other than, and obviously now I'm a bit concerned with Sean Higgins because he's our he's probably our best best on ball player, but he's thirty one. He's not getting any younger. So maybe trying to replace those players. I think we should. I think we should like look towards youth and look towards drafting because it's evident that we're not going to be we're not attracting stars. The, the dusty thing, the gaff, the Cali, that was you know embarrassing for for all involved. Um, let's not do that again. So I think just focus on young guys that you know are hungry, want to be there. Because I think our last couple of draft recruits and young young picks have looked all right. Like um, David Zuniak is you know good in spades, but he looks to be okay. Zohar's good. Um, it's been like a really good acquisition as well. Taron Thomas looked really good. Uh, Nick Larkey is starting to come into his own, so I think yeah, we should just focus on focus on the youth, the sort of the youthful side of things, because I think that's I think that's where our best strength is. You know, just getting young, hungry players who want to play footy, want to play for the club, and you know, we'll we'll be there in in the next five to ten years, and you know, hopefully be a part part of something special, not just try and chase chase players that aren't going to join us. So yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good answer. Um, yeah, you make a really good point. Higgins and Cunnington in particular are two of your best players, if not. The best two, other than maybe Ben Brown, uh, on Robbie Tarrant as well. But I mean, these guys are sort of late twenties, early thirties, so maybe it is time to sort of filter in a bit more youth. I really like LDU. I really like Tarrant Thomas. I even like really um, Jai Simpkin. Yeah. So I do think the future is bright, but it may be a case of adding to it. Um, we got Tim up in the corner here waiting so patiently uh, for the other two boys to talk about their clubs. I will transition now to Hawthorne, Tim. Um, I also want to. Oh, I'll start off. Why Hawthorne? Um, yeah, well, my family's pretty. Actually, it's pretty funny. So all of my dad's side of the family are all Hawthorne. They're all from like around that area. So they've barracks for them for generations. And all of my mum's side of the family are from Geelong. So all her side's actually Geelong. So in my family, my mum and sister are Geelong. My dad and I are Hawthorne. So it's pretty intense. And at Hawthorne Geelong games, we don't sit together. We sit in different bays. Um, so you can imagine it's pretty intense in our family. Um, but yeah, early on, obviously, I got pretty angry because we only won one flag and Thorn had won three, so they have bragging rights. But we eventually evened the scores and overtook them, which has been handy. But yeah, it's been obviously been pretty fortunate to vote for a club that's been in the finals a long time and win multiple flags. So it's been good. But, you know, we've had a couple of down years now and hopefully we've started to turn the corner. But like it, the competition seems pretty even these days. And I think it's, the competition's done well in terms of evening it out. So we might have a few few years down now but i guess you know that's what happens when you've been up for a while yeah for sure i do want to ask though as a i don't know many too too many fans who have supported a team that's won a three beat but does does winning that third flag does it diminish the joy like what's that experience like for um, you know because like because like i'm a well, real nuffy and i went to all, all the grand finals and like oh, that's all right it was the next one so like you, you enjoy them all and you sort of just got to enjoy them while you're there like i think to embrace it enjoy that moment when you're on top you don't know how long it'll last, so I enjoyed all four. So yeah. Oh, you don't have a favourite? Do you have a favourite, including two thousand and eight? Was there a favourite there? 
Yeah, I'd probably say 2014 because we were the underdog really? against Sydney and everyone said we wouldn't get within 10 goals of them. And, you know, playing wow. against Buddy again, you know, the best player in the AFL who's left your club. And then, you know, they beat us in 2012. So that was like the best. And I reckon that was the best game of footy we ever played in that sort of dominant era. Like that was the peak of our, our sort of era was that day against Sydney, that grand final, when we kicked their ass by 10 goals. So that was my favourite day by far, yeah. That 2008 grand final was probably my favourite. I'd have to say, unbiasedly, 2015 is probably my least favourite as a West say, Coast fan. I don't really enjoy 2015, yeah. No, no I, I, uh, grand final. I drove over from Perth. Yeah, okay. So, thought, yeah. I thought going into the game, I was like, I'm pretty confident we can win today. And then when Hodge yeah. kicked that goal, I thought, yeah, we'll, we've got this now. <laughs> when Chewy kicked the opening goal, I was like, there's no way we're going to lose this. <laughs> Registered about four more disposals for the opening term, but that's fine. Um... Yeah, cool. So, yeah, um, pretty successful period. I want to know what your thoughts are on how... Uh, you sort of alluded to it before um, when you said you, you, you're sort of anticipating a, a period down, but I, I want to know what to what extent you believe this current crop under Clarkson, um, how well they're poised to contend again in the near future. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I still don't know where we're at with Hawthorne because obviously this season hasn't started. I was actually kind of thinking maybe we push for finals this year with a fit wing guard, Patton and Tom Mitchell back. But like, as we said before, like, you know, you need a good run with injuries. I'm not sure we have like a good depth yet. So like, I'm unsure. Like, I really sort of don't know where Hawthorne are at at the moment because we sort of haven't rebuilt and then we don't have like the superstars, like sort of star power of all of those top teams yet. So yeah, I'm not sure where we're at. Yeah. I think that's a good, really good measured answer. I've found, and this is not a criticism of Hawthorne fans, but I, I think it's just something that happens when you support a really successful team. You kind of take it for granted a little bit how many superstars were in that Hawthorne team. Your, your Sam Mitchells, Luke Hodge, um, you know Jordan Lewis in their midfield. And um, Bergwijns, yeah, yeah. All these, yeah, they're everywhere. <laughs> exactly, and now you guys don't have that, and you, you've added some really good players, like obviously Tom Mitchell um, and Jake Romira, Chad Wingard and James Warple is a very, very good front four in your midfield, but it's not quite the same level. So I've, I've found that Hawks fans are very, very confident about where they're going, but I don't, I, well, I don't know how many believe they're going to win in, like multiple premierships again. Probably not. Um, but I think one thing they do have is that they're definitely a destination club and they can pretty much go out and recruit who they want almost because they've got that pull factor. I think they've, other than being having Clarkson, um, you know, a huge membership base, an MCG team. Um, but I think as well, they've got like great medical, um, like, uh, what do you call it? Medical facilities, I suppose. Yeah, medical staff, yeah. Yeah, which is what helped get, you know, Scully, Patton and O'Meara, I'd imagine. Oh, I think, yeah, like we're looking good. Like I think we're sort of on the right track, but whether we're sort of a top four team this year, I'm not sure. I think there's still a lot of good teams out there. Like, you know, you're at GWS, Richmond, Collingwood, who I think are all better. And West yeah. Coast, so there's still four or five teams I'd say are definitely better, and there's probably still a few more as well. So, yeah, yeah. I'm sort of at sixth to sort of tenth spot is where I see Hawthorne at the moment. Yeah, that's a really well balanced answer. But there's one thing that you pesky Hawks have, and that's Alistair Clarkson, and that's one thing nobody else has. I mean, Hardwick, um, Simpson, Buckley, uh, all very very good coaches, and they've proven themselves to be, but none of them have quite got the resume of Alistair Clarkson. What are what what are, what are your fears, or do you have fears for life after Clarko? Yeah, I think so. But then apparently Sam Mitchell will become the coach yeah. afterwards. I think we're in good hands. Ho well, hopefully we are. I think he's apparently meant to be a really good coach. And I know he helped you guys with that flag with your midfield. And I've actually heard a few of you at the West Coast midfielders talk about how clever he was in, in the coaching ranks. So I think we're in good hands when he takes over eventually. Yeah, for sure. Most, uh, I think, dedicated Eagles fans, uh, as far as I'm aware, would uh, firmly believe that Sam Mitchell was like a really, really big part of our midfield getting uh, its act together post Pritis. But um, anyway, lads, we're just about to tick over to an hour. It's been a really good chat about Sporting HQ, the documentary, um, and, you know, the footy decade in general. As a parting note, one of, you, um, one of you, maybe Cameron, if you feel most comfortable with it, tell, um, you know, or remind the, the viewers and listeners where they can find your content and where they can find your documentary. And I'll include, of course, links in the description of this video um, below. But uh, Cameron, why don't you take us away? I'm on pretty much every social media platform. So Facebook, Sporting HQ, um, Instagram, Sporting HQ Australia, I think it is, um, Twitter, um, even on TikTok now, that's been a bit of fun making TikTok videos. Yeah. Uh, that, that's unbelievable, TikTok. Like, you get so many views on it, and it's like you haven't even worked hard to promote it. But yeah, on TikTok, <laughs> if you want to check that out, 
And then the, um, obviously the website, sportinghq.com.au. And then the link for the doco is um, afl2010s.sportinghq.com.au. Um, it's also on the Sporting HQ website and on the Facebook page. Um, but, yeah, I think most people know us from the Facebook page, but, yeah, we've got plenty of other um, social media as well. Awesome. Thanks for that. And uh, like I said, I will include all the links of that in the description below. Lads, thank you for joining us for True Footy Podcast 54. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.